Okay, so then I would like to present our first presenter. Uh, <laughs> sounds like Austin Powers here. And uh, all right, one of our authors, one of our best-selling authors, by the way, she came out uh, a couple of years ago with her book, The Christ Conspiracy. This has been phenomenal seller worldwide, uh, surpassed all our expectations. And Acharya's new book, which is only a few months old and just out, is called The Sons of God. And that will be her presentation today. So now, please, a warm hand for Acharya F. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, I don't know how many of you have read any of my writings, but uh, basically I'm an archaeologist, historian, mythologist, and linguist, and discovered some information several years ago and quite, was quite floored by it and thought that it needed to get out there and realized that I had some credentials to do it, including a, a 30 or more love, year love affair with the country of Greece where I studied and excavated at Corinth, which is where Paul allegedly addressed the Corinthians. And so uh, in my 20s or so, I started, I started exploring uh, not only comparative mythology, but religion, regular, what we think of as regular religion. And that lasted quite a long time. I still study it. So now my work, what my work revealed was that there were correspondences throughout religions that were not just the philosophical or theological correspondences of uh, do good, have people do good to you, and um, it, the belief in a god or gods, but very detailed correlations regarding the particular gods that um, any given culture would study. For example, the Greek myths uh, that I studied as a child seemed very peculiar and I didn't quite understand what their significance was. They seemed, as much as I loved the culture and knew all of their names, they seemed like just oddballs doing weird things. And, uh, and you go into other uh, mythology, like for example, Egyptology, and get even a weirder thing. What are these creatures with the uh, jackal heads and ibises and so forth? And there seems to be no rhyme or reason to it. And I discovered, I believe, a thread that runs through uh, all world religions, major world religions, and probably many of the minor ones. What you discover with religion in general is that it, uh, it's not really been founded by one single charismatic individual who came out of uh, a cloud, a divine space or, or other dimension and then set up this whole revolutionary thing. What you find is that it's built on older concepts and that if, where there is a central figure, it tends, he or she tends to be a compilation of characters. Most of them, if not all of them, are not historical. So what I go into in, in my books is uh, comparative mythology and a, um, a sort of conspiratorial bent, which I took on after having met Ken Thomas. Uh, <laughs> Ken was a uh, lapsed Catholic who got a bit peeved at my information when I first talked to him. And so I had to put it in a way that he would relate to it. And the title of this book, The Christ Conspiracy, was created that very moment when I met him in my apartment in Los Angeles at that time. Uh, because I said, OK, let's put it this way. A group of men, mostly men, a priesthood that is part of a brotherhood going back hundreds and thousands of years has well honed its priestcraft to create power for itself. And uh, the priesthood's main function would be to mediate between the individual, the masses, and this god that they have essentially created. Uh, which is what you have to come to when you start reading all about mythologies all over the world. Well, this culture, the Greeks, have their gods, and the Indians have their gods, and the Egyptians have their gods, and uh, Native Americans, Central Americans, had their gods, and the Swedes and the Norse have their gods, and so on and so forth. So it's obviously something that's dependent on era and place and uh, the genetics of the people and so forth. You have uh, Africans, with, and they have black gods. Uh, the Japanese have Japanese gods. So the, it, becomes a, it becomes clear that this is a man-made endeavor for the most part. And I'm not saying there aren't divine concepts that have come through people and to people. 
And certainly a beautiful place like Sedona has brought revelation to many people. But what I am saying is that when it comes down to making it concrete, making the story concrete, or the stories concrete, uh, that it, these things are, all the, the concepts, the various concepts and ideas, uh, philosophical ideo ideologies, are hung on a historical framework that turns out to be often erroneous. And Sons of God, I, which did come out um, five years ago and has been doing fairly well and kicking up a storm in some places. And then other times it's rather dull and I wonder what's happening that no one's reading it. But <laughs> uh, I, uh, Christ Conspiracy is a very squeezed down version of what was the later book, Sons of God. I, it, I had to put as much information as I could in both books. But there were certain points of contention in the Christ Conspiracy, in particular comparisons between Krishna, Buddha, and Christ that were criticized repeatedly. And for anyone who's read Christ Conspiracy might be very happy that now I have Sons of God because I addressed those criticisms in extraordinary detail, uh, showing that even if they're not applicable in the precise manner that I had stated, they are in the long run. For example, there is a contention that a number of famous gods were crucified before Christianity. And Krishna was one of them. And that became a, point, a very strong point of contention and argumentation because Krishna is not overtly depicted in the, uh, the scriptures, the Indian scriptures, as being crucified per se in the way we think of it with, with Christ. However, if you start exploring what is the meaning behind this god on a cross, you find that there are gods on crosses uh, all over India prior to the Christian era, or prior to at least uh, the missionary era there for sure, and that, that has a specific meaning. And the same thing about, for example, the December 25th birth date. So the December 25th birth date is a very easy one for people to understand because most people know that that is the birth of the Son of God, S-U-N of God, and uh, that it has to do with the shortest day of the year and the winter solstice and the fact that uh, it seems like the, the, the God, the God's son, they called it, uh, is dying and then after three days comes back to life and there's great rejoicing at that point. Now when you're talking about myths, you're, you can't really have a strict linear evolutionary timeline. It's, it's cyclical, so these things get tossed in there. We have the sun god uh, crucified and resurrection, resurrected at Easter which is a pagan holiday and has to do with um, fertility and also the fact that for that prior period of time between the winter solstice and the uh, spring equinox, the vernal equinox, the sun is growing in strength from a um, geocentric perspective. And that at Easter, the day becomes longer than the night and it was a triumph for the god. It was a resurrection. Uh, the god was said to be crossified because of the crossing of the equinox. Now, there's some background, and uh, that's some of what the comparative mythology I go into. I go into the story of the sun in great detail in both books, and then these, these various points of con contention. For example, Krishna's mother was also said to be a virgin, um, and that's been contended because she has other children. And I go into detail about why that is true, that she was contended to be a virgin. These are not historical characters, again, so when you have variances in their tales, it's not it's not um, unreasonable because it, they have to do with natural phenomena that change quite frequently. The sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, constellations, air, uh, the water, weather, air, uh, the whole planet was spirited. And of course, if you, you don't have a, a set in stone biography of an individual, you're going to have variances. Also, depending on the era and the, the place, uh, India is a very large a continent that has subcontinent that has a huge heterogeneous population. So when when uh, the Westerners went there and tried to categorize it as having a religion, they rolled a thousand, let's say, religions into one and called it Hinduism. Hinduism is not a mono monolithic entity, uh, even less so than Christianity, where you have hundreds of different sects that are loosely fit under that. So Hinduism has varied quite a lot. And Buddhism within it, 
within the Indian framework also has varied quite a lot and has a, a, at its ideological base, a much older history than what people think of as the Buddha in the 5th or 6th century. I contend that that Buddha also is a fictional character, a compilation of characters that the sayings are, uh, that the Buddhist sayings were already in existence long before that era, that many of the concepts that Buddha represented were in existence long before that era, and that a priesthood made a concerted effort to compete with a growing, an increasingly strong Krishna priesthood at that time. And same thing with, with, uh, with Christ, that uh, this, by the way, is not the final cover of my book, um, but that Christ was also a, a, a competitive move by various factions within the Roman Empire, Jews and pagans or Gentiles alike, to unify the Roman Empire under one centralized God and, uh, and church. This had been done within Judaism many times. This had been done within the Roman, the Greco-Roman world. For example, with Serapis, who was a, a, com a combination god compiled in the fourth or third or, or second or third centuries BCE before the Common Era, uh, made up of Osiris and, Se and Apis. He was created to unify the, particularly the Greco and um, Egyptian populations. However, the Jews were extremely instrumental in creating Serapis and being um, Serapis's devotees as well. Dionysus was another huge factor in this particular creation of, of uh, Jesus Christ. The, the Jews in Alexandria, who numbered according to Philo in the first century one million, were the, uh, something like 50% of the city in Alexandria. When I talk about Jews, I talk about Israelites, Samaritans, Karaites, um, all of those who more or less followed the first five or six Bible, uh, books of the Bible, the Pentateuch and the book of Joshua. The, the people, the Northern Kingdom people were, were more, more influential in uh, Alexandria as a whole. They had more money and I think that many of the discrepancies that you find in the New Testament story can be explained by these this, these kinds of dichotomies going on between peoples who really didn't like each other but who pulled together after Judea, Palestine, Jerusalem were destroyed by the Romans. So my presentation I will go into showing the comparative mythology that leads me to those conclusions and obviously it's not everything. In my second book, <coughs> Sons of God, a pretty thick job, <laughs> uh, 45 pages on the Krishna crucified section alone, right? discuss the archetypical human sacrifice, sacred king human sacrifice that led to this gospel story. Uh, in here there's 46 pages of illustrations. So that alone, I think the illustrations are quite convincing and some of them I have here. Now, what do I push? Page up, page down? Okay. Now, since, since what I have discovered when I go back in time, when we go back in time to um, the earliest era when we find human artifacts, we discover things like this, the Venus of Willendorf, Willendorf who is a, uh, a goddess figurine by all analyses, um, the mother worshiping, earth worshiping cultures we know are very old, not necessarily um, were they superior, which is the, uh, the theories put forth by uh, <coughs> Gimbutas and others, but, but they definitely were very prevalent and uh, fertility was an extremely important factor which led to creation of entire cultures. Now I have, had, we had this set up last time with um, with the dates of these things showing, with my notes showing, and I don't know if there's a way to do that this time because uh, I did not grab my paper of notes. I can, is there a way to get the notes to show up? We had it framed last time. Well, yeah. this isn't. Show the yeah, if you go to the slideshow, yeah. you'll see the rest of the screen. And your notes would be right. On the left. Now, how do I do that? 
Where is Christopher Dunn? Christopher Dunn's not here. Yeah, Chris. Chris just went back to his room. Okay. You need your notes. Yeah, they were. They're on the. I thought it'd be easier for everyone else to. Well, that's not quite in the notes. Oh, well, that one didn't do it. Yeah, that's what. That, okay, now we're going forward. I'll go back. Um, Escape. Ah, there we go. Okay. Now, but there's a way to make this. Is there a ball in here or something? I could get rid of all that other stuff. Oh well. I thought it'd be helpful for you guys. Oh yeah, I don't even see a cursor. Yeah, I know. I can move from arrow to arrow, but I'm just wondering if I can get rid of that side of it. I don't think so. No? No, not really. No. It's going to look like that, so you can see your um, notes. Like if you want oh, to I see. I didn't even know I was moving that around. Just do that. Okay. Oh, well, this is even easier. The, the arrow is even easier. Oh, there's yeah. some notes you're talking about. Yeah, they're in the bottom. Let's go back oh, up here. There you go. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I thought that would be helpful for people to follow along. They can jot down notes. Uh, right, so this is a very old... Goddess figurine, 24, 22,000 BC. So we start finding mythological motifs popping up um, that far back, at least. In, in my book, Sons of God, I go into the prehistoric star maps that are now being found in Altamira, Spain, and Lascaux, and other uh, astonishing uh, paintings of an earlier era. Here's another Earth goddess. Mysterious Bronze Age culture of Malta built enormous temples, much of which survived underground. Numerous mother goddess statues were found in these megalithic, megalithic buildings, including one similar to this 19-inch figurine that was about eight feet tall in its complete form. The culture, which completely disappeared <coughs> at, no, let's see, over here. Yeah, the cursor on the down arrow. Yeah. Mostly won't be this troublesome. Why don't I push now? Yeah, I can get it over there and then. <laughs> oh well. Why don't we know it completely disappeared? <laughs> Let's try the next one. Oh, this is a great mystery, one of the mysteries. Exit. And now it's not working. Okay. Okay, yeah, so from those. Simple goddess statuine, statuette, statuettes and figurines. We get the sort of Madonna and child imagery going back to the fifth millennium BCE. So it long predates the Christian era. And this strange creature is actually suckling the baby uh, on breast. And then we go to Egypt and we find that these go back pretty far too. We have a 15th century BC, late bronze period of Isis and the Hittite goddess with uh, wearing a sun disc. This, this type of Im imagery becomes very crucial. Okay, now. Now, so moving on from the Earth Mother goddess worshipping or lunar goddess worshipping cultures, uh, by the way, in proto-agricultural areas, the main religion was lunar, especially in um, desert nomadic tribes, because they traveled by the night. The, the, the day sky was much too br brutal for them, and in fact, their myths make the sun a bad guy and the moon a good guy or a good girl. Uh, but we start getting into solar mythology tens of thousands of years ago, it depends on the, again, on the place. Uh, there's, where there's agriculture, we'll find a sun-worshipping culture because it needed to study the sun and know its, uh, its story intimately in order to function efficiently. And as David would tell you and many sure. others now are discovering, around the world we have, we had at one point lower sea levels and I'm quite convinced that agriculture started earlier than about 10,000 years ago, which is what we're finding on the land that is not submerged. I think personally that the agricultural societies must have been in existence with those who were creating uh, art like this or the Lascaux caves or Altamira 
that is so exquisite, do you would not have time to develop these, these kind of arts if you were a hunter-gatherer society. So I think the agricultural communities, <coughs> some of these are submerged, these paintings, that probably if we went down from where they are, we would find remnants of an agricultural community that lend, lended its help to, well, it allowed for its um, artists and spiritualists more leisure time. Anyway, these are what you start finding in reference to solar mythology, and it looks like a person's actually uh, revering the sun here. But this, this symbol, these symbols are taken as sun images. This is from Indonesia, as it says, and they're very similar to images that are found at Mohenjo-daro, which is in the Indus Valley in India, and is one of the oldest uh, oldest large cities found on Earth. And now, in the Bronze Age, it's like three to 4,000 years old, these sun images start to take on a certain anthropomorphization. In other words, they're being turned into people. And their stories are going to be start to be told as if they are people. The sun comes over the hill and he waves to the people and then he, he is in his most high temple at noon, and uh, when he goes down at night, he says goodbye, and then he gets into a battle with the night sky, which almost kills him, and there's a big struggle during the night, and all the people are praying and, and hoping that he'll make it back in the morning, which is uh, greeted with, he is risen, and he is our, our savior, they called him. Here we can see a little cultural commonality that I thought was interesting. Uh, this is a uh, Akkadian stela that was uh, from Susa, 2250 BCE. And here's Machu Picchu. It's a very interesting shape. We have two sun images or a sun and a moon. There's also a significance to the amount of rays that the sun's start taking on seven becomes a big number. And here's another solar image from, an, uh, from the Aztec culture. So uh, three different cultures with this mountain of the sun imagery. In rather disparate ages, I would personally say that the Central and South American archaeology is older, at least in its uh, in its foundations than, than what has been attributed by Western Orthodox scholarship. This one I just wanted to show you, Atsakiwaman, this megalith, uh, how astoundingly sound it is built, which indicates an advanced culture. And with an advanced culture, you will have, in my experience, an advanced uh, ideology or mythology or storytelling, language, art, architecture, obviously. Uh, so I believe that what I'm putting together as, uh, call, I'm, calling it, I'm calling it astrotheology, it's not a term that I made up, but I popularize it, astrotheology. The ancient religion goes hand in hand with these mysterious ruins. The people who built these all over the world, called uh, people call them the na navigators, that they did spread this story in germ about this astrotheological tale, um, about uh, in large part about the sun, depending on where they were and what era. Again, the navigators in Polynesia 30,000 years ago got a, quite a good grasp of um, the night sky and had a very well-developed astronomy. And when astronomy and astrology come together, which they do all the time in the ancient world, this becomes astrotheology. It's not the typical casting of horoscopes when I talk about astrology. It is the charting of the skies and then the discovery that they have, um, or the thought that they have influence not only on each other, but on the Earth itself. It's a much more cosmic concept than just writing down a birth date and trying to figure out your own chart. Uh, the worship of the sun, moon, stars, this is all astrotheology. What, what period is that? Oh, Saksiwaman? Well, it's pre-Incan, and you will have people here who probably think that it's 15,000 years old, 
possibly more, more or less. Uh, the the Incans said it was there before them, and we have talk of giants and so forth. And it's it's hard to say. I know the orthodoxy will not allow it to be pre-Incan because it's too astounding for them to admit that before their own civilization had reached such pinnacles and still hasn't, that, that somebody else could do it. It's a big mystery, that. And they're all over the world, but this one happens to be pretty fabulous. Here's uh, an observatory. It's, clear, it's quite simple that it finally became accepted that Stonehenge is, uh, is a, an astronomical observ observatory. When, I think it was, it was Hawken came out in the 60s saying just this, he was widely vilified and tormented and you know, told he was a nut job and driven out of the business. And then now in the 70s and then in the 80s, uh, people like uh, Krupp, Edwin Krupp of the Los Angeles Griffith Observatory are absolutely, con it's, 100% sure that Stonehenge is, a, is an observatory. It's not a crackpot notion anymore. The astronomers are all coming out. And now they've mapped it. We've got summer solstice, uh, this is like midwinter sunrise, midsummer sunrise. We've got all these moon and sun and stellar observations. This one, of course, by orthodox standards, Stonehenge is what, uh, four or 5,000 years old. I just thought I'd, I, I, I was at Stonehenge during a druid, uh, during the summer solstice one year, so I thought I'd put that in there, because it, it, it is quite exciting when you figure out what all this stuff means. Here's another uh, megalithic building to the sun at Newgrange, 5,000 years old in Ireland. Uh, winter solstice time, a beam of light comes in there. It's obvious that they knew about these very important astrotheological markers, and they used them for uh, practical purposes such as planting and harvesting, and also as a, um, as a spiritual experience. These caves where these great paintings are of animals in Lascaux and Altamira and so forth were apparently also used for shamanism, and uh, there's some of that in Sons of God. Just to show that we have a fairly um, consistent <coughs> zodiac image from both Egypt and India. Here's the Indian one. There are a few things different between the two, but for the most part, they got animals that were, that were the same. So we have a very early point of singularity between the Indian and the Egyptian cultures, and that's very important. There's a huge debate as to what, which one came first. And before the Sumerian culture was given uh, priority, the scholars of Europe went back and forth and back and forth. No, it was India. No, it was Egypt. No, it was Indian. Big battles. Uh, some, of the, some of the signs that are different have to do with the location. For example, the, uh, well, I can't remember in specifics on this one, but but uh, you will find instead of a, a scorpion, there's a black elk in this one, or no, there's a scorpion in this one, but they depend on, on the place. You, you would not have like a cobra in Europe, for example. It's not relevant, there's no cobras in Europe. Uh, and and this, this one is significant because, these are later images. Uh, this is Surya, the sun god in the middle, and that's who, we are mostly focused on in my work is the sun god, the god's son by the thousand names or a million names. Uh, this one's called Surya. He was a major sun god or the major name of, god's, of the god's son in India. Going back to at least the Rig Veda, which would be 3500 BCE. 3500 years ago, sorry. 1500 years BCE. And here we have the same kind of thing, a Danish sun chart, and this is the second millennium. So even in Europe, we have solar mythology being developed in a way that will all come to a point in Christianity. And um, we have numerous sun gods end up in charts. Jumping to Egypt, Horus of the horizons. Horus is a sun god. His father, Osiris, is a sun god. They are dying and resurrecting gods who battle the... Typhon or Set or Seta, 
Satan, uh, the night sky, the prince of peace. They battle him and win, and this is a, either a daily or yearly or monthly battle. Horus was called Horus of the Two Horizons, Sunrise and Sunset, and Horus Set is a dual god, uh, being Horus the, the god of light and, sun, and Set the god of darkness. So this is also interesting. This is also necessary to note that um, the these two aspects of the sun, the sunrise and sunset, were were depicted in sacred iconography, and to establish that Horus was a sun god. Uh, here is an ark at Edfu. Uh, the the name of the the town was given the epithet of Lord of the Forge City. And the city god was supposed to be a smith. So we have a smith god, smithcraft uh, cult, worshiping a smith god. At least, the smith cult dates back at least 3,000 years before the common era, includes God or Ptah as the great smith. And um, just if I could scroll down, actually, I can. <laughs> There's something else there. But this is very important in that this Ark is almost identical to the Ark of the Covenant as depicted in the Old Testament, and it shows that the Ark of the Covenant is not a unique thing. In fact, there were many Arks. Every god or goddess of any worth had his or her own Ark. Um, some of them were in identical forms as what was described in the Old Testament. And Basically, it's my perspective that you could not look into the ark or you would be killed by the priests themselves because you would discover there is nothing inside there. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they did that a few times. Yeah, here we have an Egyptian image of Amenhetep and Aten. The sun god is, is Aten. Uh, who was one of the earlier forms of the sun god in Egypt, along with Amen and Ra. Notice the hands on the ends of the rays. It was quite common, solar worship, to have your hands up like this, and then the god would reach down. Which brings me to this image. This is a Christian image, 10th century. And there's God in a sun. <coughs> reaching down in the same way. Again, this comparative mythology that shows there are really, there's really nothing terribly original to either Judaism or Christianity and that it can be found in other cultures around the globe. Again, um, but the central focus of Christianity turns out to be another sun god and it seems to be pretty obvious that the artist knew <laughs> what they were worshiping. <laughs> These are Christian monks. And the tonsure itself on here is a solar symbol that was part of the solar priesthood long before the Christian era. Uh, St. Peter's Basilica is where this is located. And these are Irish monks. And if you go to St. Peter's Basilica with a, a trained eye, you will see astronomical or astrological or astrotheological evidences everywhere. And also in the old cathedrals of Europe, you will find astrological or astronomical symbols. Twelve signs of the zodiac uh, are the, the disciples of Jesus. Uh, I just want to show here's another god, with the sun god with all the hands. Kuan Yin was called the Chinese solar deity with a thousand hands located in the sun. The sun had, for the ancients, a tremendous amount of uh, importance. And it was called King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the Son of our Resurrection, uh, God of Gods, our Savior who rises each day and brings us to life, uh, the giver of life, the sustainer of life, uh, uh, the bestower of fertility. Just about every <coughs> godly epithet you can think of was attached to the sun. And if you put yourself back in pre-Christian times before that whole story entered into your mind and just think about what you were daily hearing, you, it would be about the sun, the actual physical sun. The philosophers took it a little bit further and made a slight distinction between the sun and the power behind the sun, but they equated the two. 
it was God's eye. The moon was also an eye. And it was God's magnifier and proxy. The sunlight itself was said, was said to be God. Um, at least the power coming through it was, but in, in many places, the solar disk as well. And uh, by the way, the sun as a round entity was known at least before the Christian era in India. I go into a little bit about that and sons of God, the heliocentricity and the, and the uh, circular or, or spherical nature of, of the sun. Now, to show uh, people don't realize that Buddhism is also a solar religion, there are three ma the three major solar religions today are Christianity, Hinduism, and Buddhism. And the two lunar ones are Judaism and Islam. The sun, the, in Japan at least, these are Sanskrit terms, Bodhisattva, Surya Prabha, light of the sun. Uh, these, are in, these are from Korea, I should say, but also in Japan. I will show, I think in a second, I have another one. Uh, they, they had many deities. People believe of Buddhism as being atheistic, but if you look at Tibetan Buddhism, it's absolutely full of gods and goddesses, and it's not at all atheistic. It's, it, it's a, what I call a sort of polytheistic monotheism that you find in every culture. There will always be some top concept, whether it's nirvana or God, and then a whole trickling down of spiritual things that they would call angels or saints or um, demigods or devils even, or da daim daimons. But here we have uh, two, two solar images and mudras that they do like this are, are sun signs. And those, you can be, those can be found within Christianity too. Jesus Christ is depicted doing this. Yeah, okay, here are the Japanese sun and moon gods, Buddhist. And so they did have sun and moon gods in Japanese Buddhism. Surya Prabha and Chandra Prabha, they're called by their Sanskrit names. Surya meaning sun and Chandra meaning moon. And here is Surya the sun. This is an Indian statue, but it's uh, in a Buddhist lotus posture showing, it's from, actually it's from Java, uh, 11th century. And you can see sketches in the palms. So we have nail holes in the palms essentially. We have a, a Hindu sculpture that's in a Buddhist lotus posture, and it's, uh, it's the sun with, with holes in its palms. It's, a lot of these imagery, images all start coming together, and the people who do them, who create these images, generally are privy to the esoteric meanings behind them, or they could be just given a sketch and told to do it, but whoever's giving them the sketch, which is either a priest or a priest king or a king, some, somebody in authority, will know what this all means. These are considered solar symbols, these sketches in the palms, holes in the palms. Now, uh, Surya is driven by his charioteer, Surya the Sun. He's in his sun chart. Uh, this is from Angkor Wat, built by the Sun King Surya Varma. And these, the chariot's name is, charioteer's name is Ar Aruna, which is important to remember. We also have a, soul, a sun god. This is Helios, with the four horses being driven, driving the sun. And this, is, this was found in a, um, a temple, a Jewish synagogue, I should say. It's a forest in the fifth century CE. It's obvious that at that point, the Jewish laws against icons and id idols had been relaxed. That not that the concepts themselves had, uh, had been new to them. Although it's proscribed in the Bible, astrology, it was, it was very widely practiced. And you'll find at the Dead sea Scroll, in the Dead Sea Scrolls many types of astrological documents, including forecasts and also physiognomy, physiognomy which is the study of people's faces. And uh, Jews were known at the time, in the time that Christianity was created, to be very, very superstitious. And they did use amulets, and they knew well about the zodiac. They they knew well about all of the religious ideologies and motifs and themes and systems in their immediate area and beyond. They they studied quite well, and they occupied a large percentage of Alexandria, as I said, where there was the biggest uh, university in the known world. We don't know about China at the time, but 
the rest of the world, it was probably the largest and most populated university and majorly powerful Jews were there studying, using the texts. They knew all about everybody else's religions and they did incorporate it into their own. Um, the masses weren't necessarily to know about it, but they did. This is not the only one of numerous astrological images in Northern Kingdom temples, synagogues. Now, in, uh, in the Persian mythology, which is so closely connected, connected to India and then also is a bridge to the West because it ended up in the very area, the Levant, where we're talking about uh, Christianity getting its roots, Mithra, the Persian sun god, was not depicted in a chariot until a somewhat later period. But this was an earlier one, first uh, just a head with the rays. But uh, eventually, we got into a more complicated art. I'm kind of skipping around here. Um, here's another, yeah, as you can see, this is the Roman holiday, Hepburn Grant film. You put your hand in there. Just, just to show you how prominent sun culture was. This is, uh, this is the mouth of truth, the avenging justice of the sun. If you stuck your hand in there and it was chopped off, you were a liar. And this is very large something like this tall, very prominent in, in Rome. Here's another sun, sun, uh, sign, sun sign that dates back thousands of years, the swastika. Um, and that's why it was chosen. It was extremely powerful. It was on a lot of different things. The crooked cross. Yeah, basically, this is a collection of, of um, astrological data found in a variety of cultures around the Roman Empire. This is second century BC, the goddess TK is surrounded by the zodiac. It's just showing you that uh, it was all pervasive, the astronomical or astrotheological uh, iconography and, and, and the stories that went along with it. Here we have one of the main themes of this astrotheological religion, this, in, the, in the mysteries of them, of this religion, uh, was the central figure, it happened to be the god's son, or the sun god, by the many different names. And he was called the great architect of the universe. And uh, during the Christian era, that's how the great architect of the universe was depicted. And we have here, we had earlier a smithy cult, and this is sort of a carpenter working with the, uh, with the carpenter's compass. Um, we had a, a carpenter god back in Sumeria. She, she was a goddess, but there were also carpenter guilds that had their own religion. So in, even in the, um, the area where Christ supposedly was baptized, the Mandeans and the Nazarene, um, priesthood, Nazarenes were the priesthood of the Mandeans. The Nazarenes were carpenters. They were, they were carpenter priests, their guild was a carpenter, and so they had a carpenter god. Now you find this carpenter god motif also in uh, India and in Sumeria, dating back long before the Christian era. So also in, in Great Britain, there was a, a Zeus was his name, the tree, the woodcutter. So when Christianity began to filter into the British Isles, uh, the Celts said, no, I'm sorry, we have a Jesus who was a carpenter. <laughs> we don't need another one, but they lost out because they had gold mines and the Romans decided to get rid of them. So anyway, so we're getting a picture here that there's a lot of um, esoteric and astrological imagery going on. Here's a pretty blatant imagery of uh, our, our son, our Nostra soul, our son, our son of righteousness. See, it's described in Malachi, the last book before the New Testament. The son of righteousness will rise with healing on his wings, which is a really classic solar image of a sun disk with wings. And uh, somehow Christ ended up under St. Peter's Basilica <laughs> as Helios riding in the the quadriga chariot driving the sun across the sky, and he's got the rays and the whole bit. And it is my contention he ended up like that because he always was that, and that um, they just placed him into history. 
Christos Sole could be um, Christ our son or only Christ in the second century. That's an early mosaic. Now we have from the 11th century, creation of the world, Girona, Spain, uh, a sun god. It's just, it just says Dies Solis, which could be God alone or, God, or the sun god. And that's Christian, but that's a sun god. And I, I do believe he's got seven rays, does he? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Is it nine? Um, yeah, like these two look like they're kind of stuck on there, but seven rays is an, uh, it's a very Mithraic motif, the seven rays. Speaking of which, no. Hey, how'd you get out of order? Oh, well. <laughs> All right, well, anyway, more, more, um, Christ in solar imagery. The transfiguration is found in other solar mythologies. Naturally, when the sun goes up to a mountain or comes up a mountain, it is shining in gold. His face did shine as, as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. 12th century, we have um, Ezekiel, who does that say? Elijah and Moses on either side. Now, there's also a th common theme within other mythologies of the dying and resurrected Savior God. There's a, from way, way back, Neanderthal times, perhaps even further, the humans did have some type of perception of resurrection. And it is still found in native cultures that had not had any influence by Christians or other cultures. Um, that they had dying in uh, the pygmies, for example, dying and rising Savior God. This is a Greek image of Jason, the return of Jason, who is dead and then brought back to life in the serpent's mouth, which is kind of interesting because in the in the solar mythology, the serpent um, is killed and spits out the sun, or the sun comes back to life again. Now this dates to the fourth century B.C.E., so there's no question that it predates Christianity. Um, and it was considered, as, the, the word resurrection was used by, in this description by Campbell. We got sunrise, Lutheran mis ministries. Um, the site says, he is risen indeed, hallelujah. There are seven rays. It's pretty obvious what the esoteric um, participants in Christianity, such as the Jesuits, have known what all of this symbology is, symbolism. They will also, if you press them, admit that there's no evidence that Jesus Christ as a historical person ever existed. And they will then show imagery like this and say, well, are the monks venerating the sun and so forth? And, that has always been our Nostra Sol, our, so, our sun. I thought this was kind of amusing. This is, uh, <laughs> I thought this basically said what it was all about. <laughs> now, this really is an ancient symbol. <laughs> it's got the cross in the middle and the Eta. And this would also represent an Iota. The eta, or eta in modern Greek, which is an H, but it's an E sound, and then a sigma. And as you know, you've seen this I -E -I -H -S written on, uh, particularly in Catholic, um, where they carry an IHS on their hats, I think, sometimes, on their mitres, but they have it on their sun symbol, the monstrance. In, Translated into Latin letters would be I-E-S or J-E-S, and that was an epithet of Dionysus long before Jesus. They had the same word, just put a, an ending on it and you have Jesus. But prior to that you had gods like Dionysus and Asclepius being called Jesus, uh, which means savior, and uh, Jason. Jason, the reason why Jason is a dying and raising savior God is he's pretty much the same as the whole concept. Around the Mediterranean were these temples of 
um, gods who had these epithets, savior, healer. So you would go into the temple of Asclepius in, in, um, in Gre Greece, and you would bow down to IES, yes. Vishnu was also called yes, Y-E-S, before the Christian era. And this information is in Sons of God. Christ Conspiracy goes into um, uh, kind of a detail on all of these different comparisons, and then Sons of God goes into greater detail. I've been told Christ Count is a little bit of a breezier read, which it was designed to be, and the follow-up book, Sons of God, addressing the criticisms of it, so and it is much more scholarly. Well, not much more. I couldn't get too much more. But <laughs> so anyway, this, uh, this is apparently what the Jesuits, you can see down here how it all became combined. The Jesuits, uh, I don't know if they popularized this, uh, this symbol as a dollar symbol, but that's how it, I think this came first. Oh, now we're going to jump across the ocean. Um, <clears throat> There's a piece of shell or collar or neck arm or armor with crosses, pre-Columbian culture found in Oklahoma. As you can see, it's got numerous cross symbols of a crooked cross, which is the opposite of the swastika, uh, and then crosses here. The symbol of the cross dates back thousands of years prior to the Christian era. This is admitted even by the Catholic Encyclopedia. If you go online, you go to a Catholic Encyclopedia, you'll find these enormously surprising admissions. They don't go so far as I do to say, well, there's no evidence that Jesus Christ ever existed, and we, we, we take, I take the mythologist, per, mythicist perspective of it, but they do admit things like, sure, crosses were real popular with gods before the Christian era, and sure, there were gods on crosses before the Christian era, and I mean, the, some of the Christian apologists were all up in arms because their god was being compared to Roman gods when it disco was discovered the Roman gods were hung on crosses, and we don't hang our, our god on a cross. That was uh, Minucius Felix, a, a Christian, saying that. At that time, they did not hang their god on a cross. Uh, Christ was not depicted on a cross until about the 6th century, whereas Orpheus was in the 3rd century, and some gods in Egypt, I have pictures of these in Sons of God again, in Egypt and in Britain and uh, in India, gods were found at crossroads. They're standing like with their arms out like that for a reason. If you're at a crossroads and you want to protect as much space as you can, that's what you do. So they had numerous gods on crosses long before the Christian era. It did not, the cross did not take significance with the purported historical death of Jesus Christ. And again, across the ocean here, um, which some people call the New World, and I'm not too sure it wasn't the Old World that's been highly destroyed, and, um, but still contains a lot of fascinating secrets. <laughs> this is the cross of, of Quetzalcoatl. It's a bit messy, but essentially you can see the cross. And this is the god placed on it. Here's one arm, here's another, here's a leg, here's a leg. Now, Quetzalcoatl, this is from Kingsborough's Antiquities of Mexico. <coughs> Quetzalcoatl was analyzed by Kingsborough and others uh, using whatever texts they could get their hands on because tens of thousands of them were destroyed that would have probably shown even more correspondences. But uh, the, the people who found them, the missionaries, the priests, uh, Catholic priests were absolutely freaked out by the Central American culture and the Incans. <clears throat> South America because of all of these correspondences. They found nunneries with nuns who had taken vows of chastity and monasteries with monks who did the same, who, who absolved of sins. Um, they had a sacred king ritual where the, their god was placed on a cross. He was born of a virgin. Uh, he died and resurrected. And they had crosses. The cross was all over the country when they arrived. And so they had to try to come up with all kinds of reasons why this could have happened. Well, it was one of those, tw those 12 tribes. Uh, even though the 12 tribes did not develop this kind of Christian iconography, there were such tremendous dif uh, comparisons between Judaism, Christianity, and the New World religions <clears throat> that they had to find somehow some correspondence. It couldn't have just come out of nowhere, and it must have come after Christianity and Judaism, which is why we find these, a lot of these dates that are post-Columbian 
some, some of these objects clearly date to <clears throat> prior to the Christian era, but uh, at the time when they were discovered, they were forced, all, they had to have all come afterwards. Or there were some early Jews who had gotten here um, because the Maya tongue has some correspondences to the Hebrew. So that was a little surprising too. And, um, but there are good reasons why there was no contact and why this came from an even earlier source that um, is closer to the Chaldeans, perhaps, who were proto-Hebrews, or they, their language was proto-Hebrew. Uh, Chaldeans seem to have made their way all over the world and gotten the people involved in these stories based on the sun, not based on a single historical person who, who supposedly lived 2,000 years ago. <coughs> What's the time? The time? Yeah, you're doing okay. You got about uh, five minutes. Okay. Okay. Now, just to show some of these, uh, I am a uh, diffusionist like David. Do not believe that isolationism is a is a um, concrete thesis because there are just too many strange things that seem to be too similar for people to have come up with out of the blue. Uh, some of it, for sure, just. Just observing the sun, you would understand why in the northern hemisphere, December 25th would be his birth date. You would not need, you would not need a culture that had already developed that to come along and tell you that. You can do that by observation. So stuff like that, uh, even perhaps observing that when the sun rose at, on December 25th, it was, it, it was backdropped by Virgo. So they said that the babe was born in the arms of the virgin. Um, that is found in cultures, even in China. That you, don't, you also don't need a, a priesthood to come along and tell you. But there were some detailed things, rituals, motifs, that somebody was observing with uh, seemingly stronger than the naked eye, but certainly much more closely than many of the native cultures could. And the traditions are that people, educated people, um, civilized, developed, advanced people, did come along <coughs> and teach natives uh, numerous concepts that, we, that, that would explain a lot of these correspondences. One thing here I think is interesting is that these, we have two very separate cultures with the same kind of mudras, although they have opposite hands. Uh, there seem to be a lot of correlations between China and, and uh, Central America, including this passion for jade and these mudras, and then you know about the, the pyramids, um, that there are some pyramids in, there are lots of pyramids in China that I, nobody has really been able to study too intently, but I would wager they have some correspondences. There's also in Central America, an old, I think it's the Otomi tribe, was discovered to speak archaic Japanese, and they'd been there a very long time. So, um, Somebody obviously came to Central America long before Columbus. Again, here's another peculiar correspondence. Seems a little too detailed to just have sprung from co uh, coincidental thinking. Quetzalcoatl sitting in lotus posture, surrounded by a snake, the hood over him, Buddha, lotus posture, sitting on a, sitting on a snake with the hood over him. It's a very famous image from Central America. Central America, yeah, the Omex, La Venta. 3,500 years old, has African features. Uh, nobody could explain why this, these heads were found and other imagery. The um, modern archaeologists claim that it was uh, just, you know, the, the individual guy had some strange deformed features. And, but there were many of them. There, so there had to be either they were doing it on purpose or this is how they looked. Uh, someone else has proposed that these were sports heroes, like we have today. He is wearing a helmet, which probably was used in one of their games, but um, could also have been a king. In any event, I think it's quite evident that at least 3,500 years ago, there were African people in South America, Central America. Um, which 
shows again that there has been contact and would explain a lot of these correspondences that I go into between religions. If this religion that I uh, try to formulate, in, particularly in Sons of God, is, is real, which I think it is, it's the astrotheology, then you do find it all over the world and you find that it goes hand in hand with all of the megaliths and astonishing earthworks, um, any kind of advancement. There was a bunch of it in Native America that seems to have uh, become extremely demolished, which is probably due to its age. In Kentucky, there are megaliths under Lexington. There are enormous megaliths, you know, huge hewn stones that the city was built on. And nobody knows who put those there. And so, because the Christians didn't put them there, they don't really exist. And, you know, the natives. I, I haven't heard that. Did you, did you repeat that? You're saying that Lexington, in Lexington is built on top of these giant yes. megalithic stones. Really? It's supposed to be built on a very big city that <coughs> was hastily covered like over. I've seen quotes by professors who, uh, who were in Lexington, and I guess it's known to that inner circle, but they don't go out and put it in the local newspapers, I've I suppose. I've studied that culture. And it's actually a series of underground tunnels there that predate um, like the Civil War or something. They're not sure where they came from. Uh-huh. Okay. I have a, I have a quote in, in ChristCon. <laughs> I can steer you to where I got that information from. Yeah, well, here I'm just trying sh to show that, um, again, we have uh, strong resemblances in, in the peoples on the planet, and um, ideology goes hand in hand with, with uh, building and also with um, people you're related to. Now, these faces all seem very similar in their bone structure. They have the same nose. Same high cheekbones, same kind of high forehead, although his is a little not so much. And they're completely different ethnic groups. Um, is it diffusionism or is it microevolution? Or both? Could be both. Uh, the anthropological explanation is that they were in cool, the noses are from cool, dry climates. And so it's not governed by a common ancestry. So uh, I think there's quite a mystery as to where people come from because they, they do vary so tremendously. And then you have things like this that are kind of mysterious. And then this last slide I have here of uh, aboriginal children with blonde hair. I'm try to figure out where the heck I am. That's my next project would probably take me the rest of my life is to figure out where the heck all the human species came from because there's some very serious peculiarities that um, you can't explain. I, I, I've heard aboriginals of um, northern India be described as Caucasians with dark skin. I said, well, okay, if skin color is not the determining fact of whether you're a Caucasian or a black or a Chinese than what is. It's, it's a very confusing science. Uh, I bring it up because it kind of winds up what I'm discussing, which is that the world's religions and mythologies have much in common and they are based on human experiences and that humans are essentially the same everywhere. Um, and for example, let's say with a black culture, the pygmies had a son of God who was put to death on a tree by a wicked priest and he, he, ro he rose after four days. And their culture has been described as a, a Caucasoid people with, with um, dark skin. <laughs> and um, that story existed long before the contact with any white missionaries or anyone else. Um, and you can see that, that same basic prototypical story going through Egypt and getting more details added to it. Wise men at the birth and sheep and teaching in the temple of the high and so the most high and um, starting your ministry at 28 or 30 degrees, which has to do with, with uh, either the lunar moon, the lunar, the lunar cycle, which is 28 <coughs> days, or the degrees of the, um, the circle when it's cut into 12 parts, 30 degrees. You move 
after 30 degrees, you move into a new, a new cycle. Um, which, uh, briefly, I'll say that I have the story of the sun in my books that corresponds to the story of Jesus Christ, the story of Bush, Bushna. <laughs> Bushna, Krishna, Buddha. <laughs> yes, can we cru crucify him and resurrect him after that? He's the son of another famous. But the father is supposed to die before the son is resurrected. It doesn't make any sense. So, <laughs> yeah, anyway, so. Um, uh, these stories all come together, they have the same similar motifs, and uh, I do believe that the story goes back thousands of years prior to the Christian era, and that and it was, a framework was there when, when this, uh, bands of traveling priests started going all over the world, but then they added the details to it. That's kind of my uh, thesis in a nutshell. I also have here, in addition to the two books, I have Two steam shovel magazines that have articles of mine. This, this one has an article called Jesus Christ, Mason of God. Uh, it's, it's an excerpt that's maybe slightly differently written than what's in Sons of God. I do go into Masons and the Brotherhood in Sons of God. I go into it in Christ Con too, but not as much detail. And this one also has an excerpt that is probably different than the book. Um, uh, it's Josephus unveiled or something. It's uh, no evidence of Jesus and Josephus. So these are all on that table back there. And I think I can take some questions. All right, that was good. Yes. Thank you. We do have time for some questions. Or I could play Sally, Jesse, Raphael. <laughs> <laughs> you have to follow me around. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I was on an island too, where, where I became a cargo cult god. Was one of <laughs> I was a cargo cult. The kids cult on that island in Melanesia, near, it's near New Guinea, but they all had red hair. Yeah. And the kids, it was really kind of strange that you know there's these Melanesian kids. Right. But yeah, they had curly red hair. The Phoenicians <laughs> got everywhere. Huh? Sorry, right. How do you think? What, or what, is your, what is your opinion of how it moved from a female uh, worship to uh, a male worship? Because in the beginning, you were showing a right. female. So what, I'm, that's where I'm always hung up. Is how, did the, why, how did that, the matriarchy become the patriarchy? Yeah, what, what made that well, along yes. the same lines, was the sun always identified no, with the no, male no, and the moon with no. the female? Or, or was the sun no, a woman no. too? Excuse me. Yeah, yeah, the sun was a female was, god. Was the pivotal character, I think. Is, is that your understanding? Mm, maybe in that part of the world, but I'd have to look more closely at that. In, in the Sumerian, you mean? What changed? Well, I, you know, I don't know if it was... It's, the whole fertility aspect. I, somewhere along the line, men decided to usurp the women's power, right? You just, yeah, it's hard to say what, what exactly changed at some point. Oh, the warrior cultures started coming from the north. Well, the that we were talking about, that, that, uh, that uh, coagulated at some point yeah. in time, and then still wants to keep its power. So because the, the female thing is more ethereal, and the male thing is more Yeah, well, the, re the book of Revelation is basically an, an assault on the goddess, who was still quite popular at the time, the whore of Babylon, Ish Ishtar. Um, the mark of the beast was the mark of the goddess. The 666 was a sacred number in, in goddess worshiping cultures. Um, well, the Yahwists certainly took it to an extreme. It seems to me that this kind of Indo-European Yahwist cult came in and started rattling. We have a warrior god, and it's a male. And yeah, we got the power base. Yeah, and you serve us, and they turn them into slaves and servants, and how convenient. I, what changed that? I, I don't know exactly. I can't, I can't figure it out. <clears throat> Sexual frustration. I think you can <laughs> say that uh, part of that was simply the development of the left brain or the right brain. The more in Neolithic uh, cultures, there was more of the development of the right brain. There was more of the connectedness, feeling of the connectedness. 
as you develop the left brain, there's more of a sense of separateness. At that point, you want to set boundaries. At that point, you want to protect your boundaries. At that point, you create armies. To protect huh. your boundaries. Huh. Oh, well, that reminds me of um, the, the Sahara, Sahara Asia. Uh, thesis by Jim DeMio, where he talks about the desertification of the land, uh, causing them to go into survival mode with this reptilian brain that is now predatory. It loses its empathy, the feeling of love, and now becomes predatory. So it could be the desertification of that area. Yeah, in a similar way, what uh, Gail to answer your question, which I'll get into next, is because the cataclysmic changes that happen over time where civilization just came to a grinding halt. And people were, it was like, you know, people went back to the Stone Age and became more of a hunter-gatherer, more of a violent world that people lived in. I mean, that we wanted yeah, to, you know, cyclical. So the males became more dominant then. The males. Uh, yes. Why do you feel that uh, the Gospels of the New Testament are not evidence that there uh, was uh, or historical in the sense that it was based on particularly what we consider the letters and the work of the apostles and the uh, uh, historical personage of Paul and the others. Why are you? What are the apostles spared in India, St. Thomas? <laughs> <laughs> well, I go, I go into, first of all, I don't think that Paul is a historical character either. I think he's a compilation of a few uh, people. Orpheus, who was not historical, but there was a historical Saul in Josephus. Um, the, the Gospels themselves are not found in the literary record or archaeological record until the end of the second century. If you go and you look at the extant literary ec record, none of the early church fathers discuss them. Therefore, they are not written by who they were claimed to be written by. They are very poorly written in the sense that the places they describe, it is obvious they've never been to. And they also used the Septuagint or Greek Old Testament as their history books or topography books, which was a, a really crucial mistake that in retrospect, now we're looking back, we can say um, they, ha they used to name places that had been out of date for four or 500 years. And they, they set the story in this wild badlands full of sheep when in fact it was a highly populated, overcrowded area. It was only 90 miles long. So. It, the, if you studying the, gospel, the canonical gospels, you, you pretty much can tell these are not history books written by eyewitnesses. And then if you start picking out the details of the stories that you do find in other cultures, being stuck in the side with a spear, Odin is hung on a tree and stuck with a mistletoe spear. There's just what I say is that you, there's no core to the onion. You start peeling away these mythical accretions, and there is no core to the onion. As, as far as Paul's letters go. There are some excellent studies going back a couple hundred years and culminating with a book by uh, Earl Doherty called The Jesus Puzzle, where he, he, dis he basically shows that Paul is not talking about a historical character. He's talking about the Gnostic, uh, the Gnostic god, Jesus, who in the, in the Docetic view, the Docetic view was the most popular Gnostic branch at the time, uh, could not take human form and never did take human form. Um, matter being evil, so uh, so that's what you find in the in the oldest uh, canonical texts is this this phantasm, this fantastic God Jesus, who was not who never was on the earth. Well, I have a follow-up question. What do you say to those who not only uh, feel that uh, that there was historical background for this and that? It's not surprising it took 200 years for this to coalesce because of the culture at the time and things were passed down for, from uh, oral and generation to generation. But that there is physical evidence of the historical personage of Jesus' travels in India, St. Isa, yeah. the writings of Notovich, you're rejecting all of them as having yeah. historical pieces. Yes, I, I'm rejecting that as being, as being way too late uh, as having any evidence. Um, Isa happened to be the name of the god Shiva, who was widely worshipped all over India. And so it is also the name of Apollo. So if you had stories of god Shiva as Isa, then you roll, start rolling those stories. Oh, look, we have a god Isa too. And they start writing these together and so forth and so on. I did, a, in another magazine called Paranoia, I addressed the, uh, the lost years issue. Those, the texts that the story are in, the Notovich text is easily um, analyzed and picked apart. 
that you can see the forces at work in there, why they were written. Uh, often they are written in order to promote Buddha above Jesus Christ. So they're based on missionary, the responses to the missionaries essentially saying, yeah, you've got this great God man and I suppose we should fall down and follow you, but ours taught him and he's just a student, so we're going to stick with ours. And that's, that's what you find in there, in those texts. Um, the note of each one is an example of the, the, the Jews are portrayed in a very friendly manner. And at, right at the beginning of the text, it says, this is what was told us by a caravan coming from Palestine. It does not say Jesus was here. It says, this is what was told us. So it, these are traditions. And the, 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 the uh, grave in Kashmir, I, I understand somebody's going to try to go get some DNA and match it up with the Shroud of Turin. And I think that would be very amusing because it will never match. But there's a grave in, in Kashmir of uh, someone they call Yusa Saf. It was my understanding that the word Yusuf Saf means Joseph. And um, Joseph just means priest. And that could be just a priest. It happened in other countries, too. The priests of a religion would take on the name of the god that they're representing. And all of a sudden, you had this god you know, down the street there at the corner drugstore. <laughs> and it wasn't really him. It was his priest. Um, that happened in Shingo, Japan, where they claimed to have the bodies of Jesus and his brother. His, his brother was accidentally crucified in his stead, and they fled to Japan with his remains, and Jesus lived to be 120 and father a bunch of children. Uh, what was discovered, and the, the people in Shingo will insist, this is an absolute fact. That, that is the historical Jesus. He is here. We have the graves. But it was discovered that these were graves of two 16th century monks who were preaching in the name of Jesus. So... Oh, uh, yes. Um, the... Uh, the, re the remains or the relics of uh, the Arm of Christi that was found in the Gulta by the Empress Helena, who was the mother of Constantine, included the uh, cross, supposedly that Jesus was crucified on, as well as the crown of thorns, um, and actually some of the relics, also some of the other relics associated with the passion, even the sponge that was offered to Jesus. Um, and uh, apparently those things still exist, the crown of horns, uh, down, and the nails of the cross having become the spear of Maurice, um, and become the uh, Lombard um, crown, and that the, the big cross being divided up into uh, a billion smaller pieces of wood which still exist. So I wonder how you reconcile that, and also the idea that a lot of those uh, artifacts, a lot of those relics, contain some very supernatural sort of power to them, and they eventually became holy rails, and simply by owning one, possessing one, and being around them, the energy of these things would have a transformative effect on people. So it does appear as though they were, they had been in conjunction, they had been approximately to a very high and mighty spiritual being that was generating a lot of spiritual energy. Well, that, that would be a long conversation about yeah. the whole spiritual aspect of it. I, in a word, relics have been fabricated since the beginning of time, so that, that's not a trustworthy um, uh, piece of evidence. Uh, there were, you know, like 14 of Jesus' Jesus's one foreskin at different churches. Um, obviously, they were bogus. Uh, relics of monks, sure, we do have skull caps of monks and fingers of them. Uh, there was nothing found in Jerusalem until... Um, Helestine's, Hel uh, Helen, Helen, Constantine's mother, offered some money to an old man. Nobody had ever heard of this story. Um, there, grave, oh yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of crosses over there. There was a graveyard of crosses, so they picked one out and they said, this is Jesus's. But prior to that, no one had ever heard of the story. No one knew anything about it. Suddenly, someone comes up with some money and says, we need a cross. Boom, there's a cross. Same thing, I'm sure, with anything else. They found diaper pins that Mary used on Jesus. I mean, it... There, the, the relic making it was a huge business. There were baskets full of myrrh and gold sold at Constantinople. Um, letters fabricated uh, in the hand of Jesus. Uh, and as, as concerns uh, any kind of um, supernatural energy associated with it, well, I suppose if it, if it were measurable, uh, it could be found on relics of just about any other religion too. Although, uh, I mean, they have, you know, supposedly Yeti skull caps in, in Tibet, and I'm sure that if you 
found some type of measurement, it would show that there's something strange about that Yeti skull cap. Uh, it, that's, that's a really objective uh, conversation that's hard to, hard to get into. I'd, obviously, there'd have to be all kinds of sciences uh, attribute, uh, these submitted to all kinds of sciences to actually measure that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, I know you could have a lock of your mother's hair and feel empowered, spiritually empowered by it. So that's, that's a hard question. There's a temple in Sri Lanka with the tooth of Buddha, you know, the temple of the tooth. So, right. Yeah. They had, yeah, they had, there are dozens of God, of Osiris's tombs. Mm. Uh, in, you know, one of the things with the Jesus in India thing, too, which, you know, is, is that Buddhism came very close to the Middle East. I mean, it was, it was, it was very well known. I mean, that's something that Christian scholars and Middlest don't really realize anymore. Right. Afghanistan was a Buddhist country in that, during those times. Yeah. And even, even in the religion of Tammuz, which is found in the Bible, it's a dying, rising savior God who had the same qualities. Tammuz is Thomas, the disciple Thomas. If you go to India, there was a whole cult that worshipped Thomas, T-A-M-A-S. Well, it's interesting how even the word Christ and Krishna are similar. They, in, baptism also being a Hindu thing of being In Bengali, or... Bengali, they call Krishna Christo. So... Right. You got, it used to be his name, Krishna, used to be transliter transliterated Krishna. Mm. I've been to that tomb in Kashmir that you're talking about, Yusasov and stuff. And also they believe that... Um, Moses. Moses, and they also believe that Mary, mother, is, is also buried in Deradan, in that mm -hmm. it's a Pakistan side of Kashmir. And Mary is also buried in, the, in Ephesus. Too, Ephesus, so. <laughs> she supposedly lived in Ephesus, yeah. Oh, that's Which another had book. Cold running water at the time. That's another book, by the way. very luxurious life to live in those days. The, all right, your That's time it. is up, hon. So, uh, just warming in for Thank you. Okay, that was good.